So. Amazing. So welcome to your financial freedom, step one. And we're going to be diving quite a lot into the topic of budgeting. Is it restriction? Is it freedom? We're going to hear some fantastic real life insights and stories from Cav, who's a member of the vet community and the vet you community as well. And we really are all about us being a group of empowered individuals that really are taking action on our finances with the help of amazing people like financial advisor Ruth Downs, that is a familiar face no doubt to many of you and um, because she's helped so many vets and vet nurses in this space already as well so we just wanted to start off with while we're letting a few more people connect because we're only one minute in let us know in the chat box what was the last thing that you bought because you now have a lifetime supply of it I don't know about anyone else but I think the last thing that I bought was some Italian hard cheese. So there we go. I now have a lifetime supply of pasta topping. Um, how about you guys, Ruth and Cav? I was just telling you, wasn't I beforehand? I've just bought a sofa today. Don't need a lifetime supply of sofas to barely oh, get into wow. the room. I know. Had an argument with the door in the process. So yeah, don't need a lifetime supply of that. Thank you very much. Oh, and we've got in the chat box a bacon double cheeseburger for lunch. Oh, Definitely nice. Lifetime supply of that. <laughs> lifetime supply. Yeah. Keep them coming. Keep us telling. Because again, this is just awareness of where's our cash going. I know it's a fun icebreaker, but at the same time, like, where are we spending? Are we tracking it? And is that restriction? Is that freedom? And hopefully after this session, we'll start to see that there's a lot of freedom in that as well. So pop those in the chat box as you are thinking. Um, Ruth, how about how about you? Sofas, burgers, Italian hard cheese. Can you up that? I think I'm, I'm on a really fun, free, fat free thing diet at the minute. So I think it was some yogurt. How boring is that? <laughs> yogurt uh but yeah i think my last online spending was one of these ads that came up and it was a toilet brush that i haven't put up yeah yeah so <laughs> lifetime of toilet brushes i mean what more could you need <laughs> oh exciting oh. Um, oh yeah super thank you everyone for dropping those in the chat box get us some more in as we go as well but we're going to start diving into what we are here to talk about this evening because we think it's super important so before we get started we're going to do how we're going to roll and um, this was the closest roll picture i could find for you apparently it's the cinnamon roll when squinting it didn't quite look like that so we've got that explanation there but anyway as vet you, we are a supportive community. There are no stupid questions here, so please do ask away. We're really in the lucky position that we've got Ruth, the financial advisor here. You can send direct messages to myself, to Cav, to Ruth, if you want to send them anonymously, if you don't want us to read your name out, do that and use this space and use this time that you gifted yourself to get on track with finances, to check back in with what's important to you and get those questions asked as well. Make the most of being here live, because yes, the recording is amazing. You can still ask us questions, but take advantage of that too. In a minute, we're gonna do some quick intros of who's on this call. And um, we're going to talk about why we're doing this session. And in brief, we get asked for it a lot. People say, I'm not just, I'm just not quite sure where to start. Like, what does financial freedom look like? What's my next step? Where should I head? Have you got any resources around budgeting? And actually, when we listen to Cav's story, we realized she was going to be a really good person to give you a lot of insights here. And obviously, with the fantastic Ruth in the background as well. So she is going to be here to give us expert opinions and um, lots of top tips along the way as well. We're going to start with doing a little bit on getting clear on what you want. Because quite often when we talk around finances, it can feel quite restrictive. It can feel like oh, budgeting. It can feel like we're pulling on the purse strings. It can feel like we're, we're holding back our cash or maybe it's a bit of a scarcity thing. But actually, when we think of money as a vehicle to take us towards what we actually want and thinking about the lifestyle that we'd like to lead or what our goals are and what our backup plans are, then it is just so powerful. So we're going to get clear on that. We're going to get you some tools to get started. That's where our budgeting starts to come in. And we're also going to talk about what we can protect along the way as well. And then, of course, plenty of time for Q&A at the end as, as well. So just a quick bit about VetU as a company as well. So many of you have been on our calls previously. We were first founded by Paul Harwood and Matt Dobbs, the lovely two gentlemen on the top row of the images there. And they came together as vets saying, you know what, when we graduated, we got really solid financial advice. And it meant that we were independent as ourselves. We had protections, we'd planned our future, and we kind of got these cushions around us that 
we knew that if something were to happen to us or maybe we're in a position where we were comfortable to take what might be considered a, a risk either in, in business or maybe to prioritize a bit more time for something else in their lives. And then between them graduating and Ebony and I graduating, there really wasn't that much information or education came up. So we had the opposite end of the scale of discovering that really it would have been useful for us to take action on our pensions about 10 years before both of us did. So we've got a real mixture of us as veterinary professionals that have come together, not as financial experts, not as accountants, not as financial advisors, but as genuine real members of the community that care about everybody here to try and get you in contact with good, sound, timely financial advice and let you be an independent you as well, looking at the areas of your health, your income and your future. And that is what we hope that today is going to help empower you around as well to reconnect with you as an independent individual you and help you get in touch with the people that can make you um, help you make the next steps and give you some of the tools to do that too. Because let's face it, you all work super hard and nobody teaches us about this stuff in schools. And I wish they did do because heck, I wish that I'd done a lot more probably about 15 years ago. But the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is today and that's why we're here. And then we have two fantastic guests that we are so grateful to have with us this evening. First of all, we've got Cav, who is a recent graduate veterinary surgeon waving away at you. Cav approached us and said, look, I love what you guys are doing. I've got a really interesting story, which he's going to share with you. And we said, look, this is really this is going to resonate with a lot of people. There's some real wisdom in here. Come along, tell your story. And um, I know we've got the fantastic Alice on here as well, who has done similar for us too in the past as well. And we've, uh, we've loved embracing our community. And then finally, we have Ruth Downs, who is a brilliant financial advisor, so down to earth. I'm blown away by the fantastic testimonials that we get every time that Ruth helps someone from our community. She's spoken to in excess of we have 150, 200 vets and veterinary nurses now. So she 200. really does know. 200. Mm. I feel like that's a milestone for us to celebrate. <laughs> 200. So she knows the landscape of what's going on here. So if you think you're alone in your finances, she has probably already heard similar. I imagine that's right, isn't it, Ruth? Absolutely. I challenge someone to tell me something that I might not have heard before. And I'll be honest and tell you if I haven't. Obviously, I can't tell you what others have said but I'll tell you if I haven't heard it <laughs> yeah I've heard definitely. all sorts oh thank you so much Ruth and yeah we are always so clear that there are people out there that have trained in this stuff and yes we can educate ourselves let's do that let's really put ourselves in the driving seat but let's also stand on the shoulders of giants of people that really know this stuff inside out and are willing to gift their time and their expertise as well like Ruth so what do we want to start with? I'm really briefly going to take you through as thinking a little bit about what we want from our finances. So in my role at VetU, as well as being a vet, as well as um, being in the position of coming on to be part of the VetU team, I'm also a coach too. I run my own businesses and I've done an awful lot around my own money mindset as well. So we've got lots of insights from this front. So I just wanted for us to take a few minutes to think about what we actually want and where we are now. So I'm not going to get you to do this at the moment, but we do have a worksheet that you will find in your Zoom link when that came through. There's a download link. So you can get that. You can print that out. You can do that afterwards. You can go through those questions because they're really powerful sometimes for us to ask ourselves. But so often, and we said this before, when we talk about budgeting, like oh, it's pinching pennies, it's holding back, it's, it's maybe it's quite draining or it feels quite scarce. But actually, like we said before, this is us when we're thinking about freedom, using it as an empowerment tool of where can this take me if I take these actions today? Where are my gaps? What do I need help with? So what I wanted to just talk about for a minute is quite often we might know that we feel like we're just not very good with money. Or maybe we feel like things are OK, but they could be better. Or maybe you're an absolute financial pro. Hats off to you if you are. We're not taught much on this stuff. And so often we get people coming to us being really judgmental, being really hard on themselves for not knowing what to do. But we don't know what we don't know. We don't know what we've not been taught. So much of what we know around money has come from our primary caregivers, our upbringing, the people that we surround ourselves with. And it's not always the most useful stuff. So when we're talking about step one, quite often that is us getting clarity on where we are right now and also where we want to be. Now, this isn't us getting really het up of, oh, I don't know my passion. I don't know my why. I don't know my goals. That's that's OK. We're not going to end up in a crisis over that. We literally 
just going to look at where do we sit right now and what are the kind of things we might want to feature in our future and then how can we integrate finances and what will be our barriers and how might finances be something that can help us around there or who could help us through them so the trouble is that most people are clear on either of these things they know that they're not that good with money self-proclaimedly i know that was me for a long time as well so hats off i'm sat there if you resonate with that and they also say i just want to be a bit better but we don't know where we want to go with it and when we want to sort our finances sometimes we need a bit of inspiration so actually is it that freedom for us is going to be that we want to maybe get a bit more balance in terms of we want to go part-time eventually and getting our finances in order could take us to that is it that it looks like we want to go on so many holidays per year. Maybe we want to start a side business. Maybe it's just that we want a backup plan in place that if we do want to take up a long period of time off, we know that we can sit easy in the fact that we can do that. So like we said before, one of the reasons that Matt and Paul started Vet You is to put people in this driving seat of where you are now, where you want to be, and cushioning the landing in between those things so that it's easier for you to make that move forward. So we're thinking about what freedom actually means to you because it's gonna be individual to each of you, but there will be some common themes, things like considering our future in general, like what do we want our future to look like? And future retirement, future in five years, future in 10 years, and also protection along the way, which I know Ruth is gonna dive a lot more into towards the end as well. But the reality is that most of the time, it's probably more of a squiggly line than a straight line. We're gonna have hurdles thrown at us, we're gonna have unexpected things, and that's more reason for us to look at what are our backup plans, what are our safety nets, and what are the things to help us as well. So finances are behind so much in our lives. And thinking about what we actually want, is it like we say, part-time working? Is it a new home? Is it to start a business? Is it two holidays a year? That's gonna look different to everyone but get clear on what's valuable to us and then incrementally how we can start it because that's the next big thing. Oh my goodness, how am I going to get from here to there? Let's take that pressure off because that's not actually one big jump. That's in tiny little moves and sometimes with help from other people like Ruth, for example, or insights from Cab as well. So let's get clear on what, then we can start to look at the incremental steps of how, our habits, our small steps, our budgeting, and we'll do more on that later. And maybe our why, like, what's that going to feel like? Like, why do we want to start getting on top of this stuff? What's that going to enable us to do? So let's let finances be a bit more empowering to us rather than it being something that oh, I should probably sort, sort that out at some point. So we're going to break this down into bits. So essentially what we're saying at the moment is let's have a little look, getting really clear on our situation now, which I know that Cav will go into a bit more detail on. We have also done plenty of sessions on filling out a financial questionnaire, which is what goes in, what goes out, getting real clarity. Ruth and I recorded a whole session on that that will pop in the chat box afterwards. And I'm gonna pop up some questions on the screen as well in a minute that are in the workbook that you can go through just to really get clear on what direction am I heading in and how a finance is gonna take me there. And you might realize that when you set up, where am I now, perhaps some spare cash around. Maybe you want to go to someone like Ruth and say, what's the way for me to maximize this in my future? Is it to invest it somewhere? Is it to um, look at having an emergency fund? So we don't know what we don't know, essentially, to remember. So it's just getting clear on what does the future look like without getting into, a, oh my goodness, I'm really not sure. It can be really like a little bit vague to start with. Oh, I think I'd like to just make sure that I've got maybe a, a deposit for a house at some point. And let yourself get excited about that. I know sometimes in the current climate that feels difficult, but at the same time, like what direction do we want to head in? Where are we now? What does that look like? How are we going to get from now to the future? What little habits would happen on a daily basis? Why? How's that going to feel? Who's going to help me along the way? So often we expect pet owners to know a certain amount about looking after their pets on a day-to-day -day basis, but we don't expect them to know how to... Um, fix them if they're unwell or how to treat them if it's something more complex or even in a more specialized area we just say look we trained for years in this this is why we're here to help you and that's why we're so keen to connect people with professional financial advice that's timely and that's actually um expert as well because we don't know this stuff so we may as well forgive ourselves for never having been taught it i'm not going to go training as a financial advisor anytime soon i'd rather go to ruth who did all the training already and what are our safety nets, whether that's income protection, whether that's us looking at emergency funds, both most likely. So we break all these things down. But all I want you to do to plant the seeds at the moment is let's think about starting to get clear on where we are now, 
and where we want to be because traversing the gap between those two is going to be our daily actions, who we ask for help and what things that we put in place as well. So questions that we can ask ourselves, and these are on the workbook, so please don't worry about writing them down, but give yourself the time and the space to consider them, is where am I right now and where am I headed? And again, without judgment, let's, we weren't taught about money, so let's take the pressure off. What do we really want? How will money affect this? Is it that you want financial independence, retire early or non aspire? Is it that you actually do want to go to part time? Is it that you want to own a practice? Is it that you want to run a side hustle or a side business? Is it that actually you want to spend more time with your family? That's going to be individual to you. And that's going to tie in with what will success look and feel like. What would the first micro step be? Because so often we put pressure on ourselves that if we can't sort it all out in like two hours, then it's not worth sorting. But I know Ruth will, will share some insights, I'm sure, that sometimes it is just those tiny steps at a time. Who could help me? And the final one that's really powerful is sometimes... How can I change the hurdles into strategies? Because so often when we have thoughts coming up going, yeah, but you don't know how to do that. Let's see if we can flip that to, let me see who can help me find out how to do that. So every time there's something that comes up as a, an obstruction to us not being able to do it, let's see if we can flip that into a strategy to help us move towards where we want to be incrementally. So again, in your worksheet, because I've not got time to go through it now, we've got a whole section on financial smart goals, which are goals that are specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time bound. This is us just getting a goal that we can put on paper with our finances that we can move towards that is realistic and relevant for us. And I know certainly this is something that Ruth helps lots of people around too, when they're looking at, right, what's the next thing for me in my finances? So there's a worksheet that you can work through on that in general. And again, I'll pop the link in the chat when I hand over in a minute too. And then finally, before I hand over to the amazing Cav, because I've spoken for more than long enough, I just wanted to highlight a really cool study that we have found at VetU and we spent quite a lot of time looking into. So essentially, Hirschfield, who was a psychologist at UCLA Anderson um, School of Management in the US, he started to look at why do people not want to invest in their future? So you'll hear Ruth talk a lot about the fact that a hundred year life is a thing now. We're more than likely to be retiring at perhaps 65, 68, maybe even older. And then we've got another 32, 35 years. And yet so many people don't have enough money put away for that. So he started looking into, right, why is it that we do not invest in our future? And he started to look at how much we associate ourself, our current self, with our future self and with another person. And he realized that when they did brain scans of people asking them about those people and certain traits of them, that we more closely associate our future self with a different person completely, a another. So when we come to think about investing for the future, unless we're really thinking about our future self and remembering it is us, it feels like we're giving money away. Same thing happens with budgeting sometimes. It can feel really scarce and it can feel really restrictive because we're like, oh, but I'm going to miss out for the sake of this person slightly in the future. So it's just a reminder that actually our future self is us. If we carry on with the exact same habits and do the exact same things every day, our future self is going to be the same person as us. So if we want to make changes for our future self, we need to make those changes today. And interestingly, what they did was they CGI'd people to look in a mirror and realize what they looked like when they were aged. And those people saved 30% more towards their retirement once they'd aged themselves and they saw older self in the mirror. So this isn't just about saving for retirement and saving for pensions. This is about us considering when we're taking those small habits towards our budget, towards us maybe jumping on a call with Ruth, towards us um, going and looking at our bank balance. It's us asking that question of like, what will my future self thank me for? How can I remember that that's me? And that's a really powerful thing to do. So we really love that study because like we say, why are we talking about budgeting tonight? Because when we're moving from that where I am now to where I want to be and we've started to get a bit of clarity around it, it's in those little actions that we're taking on a daily basis, maybe on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis that are going to take us from there to there rather than the whole, if you always do what you've always done, you're always going to get what you've always got. So we do take judgment off ourselves, but we're thinking about what well, those little habits and budgeting is a big one of those as well. So I wanted to hand over now to Cav, who is a fantastic member of the VetU community. Like I said, it reached out to us to tell us her story. And she really did show the power of getting on top of this stuff and realizing that that where you want to be 
And that financial savviness and, and realizing what we can do with our finance isn't always about big goals and, oh, I want to buy a massive house somewhere. But sometimes it is about having that padding and that cushioning as well. So, Cav, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so you guys on your screen now have got a very oversimplified kind of list of how I've ended up here. Um, but it's the main reason that I want you lot to sort of start caring about your money it's the main reason that it kind of is driven home how important it is to me to sort of at least be a little bit in control um and yeah if you strip it sort of right back to the beginning like Katie was saying about a sort of a lack of education in regards to money that very very much applied to me so I grew up both my parents are Sri Lankan I grew up in a massively like eastern traditional household so my dad was very much in charge of the money and the finances and my mum was very much in charge of raising me and my brother and as far as I know my parents didn't communicate about money at all and when they did it never ended up being a productive or nice conversation and they certainly never spoke to my brother or I about money but then when I came to Liverpool Uni as a vet student in 2015 there was just this expectation that I wouldn't get myself into trouble financially and I'd know exactly what to do without ever having been taught what to do and because my mum had grown up in a very similar situation she didn't have any of the answers when I was asking how much I should be setting aside for a water bill or um how do I even go about setting up bills and things like that she just didn't have a clue because that's the way she was raised too and my dad and I didn't have the kind of relationship where I could ask about that so it was very much left to my own devices um Luckily, I found that I quite enjoyed reading and sort of researching it. A lot of Googling went on to kind of sort of form a very rudimentary budget. And then as I sort of got further into uni and refined it and got better at it, I found it a lot easier, but certainly did feel like very much out of my depth when I began trying to work out how far my student loan was going to go and all of those things. And then kind of like fast forward a couple of years as I was coming towards the end of uni, decided that after I finished I wanted to travel so started like actively putting money aside towards that because obviously like especially with student loan I wasn't managing to save much so I knew I was gonna have to start early um and then it very quickly became clear with the COVID situation that traveling after graduation wasn't going to be an option so so towards the end of final year I made the decision that I'd go straight into work instead not that I obviously had a huge amount of choice but that I would leave that travel fund that completely untouched or as untouched as I possibly could so that when the world reopened I could go traveling did all the things I thought you were supposed to do all the things that the vet you community champions like um interviewing practices as much as they interviewed me tried to negotiate my contract tried to ask all the questions um and started working the beginning of August right after graduation and for the first few months I was all right but very quickly realized I probably wasn't where I was supposed to be and by Christmas gone I really like I wasn't doing all right I was coming home like bawling my eyes out most nights really unhappy at work realizing I was spending a lot of my waking hours sort of miserable at work and when I wasn't at work I was okay which obviously like a lot of you will know when you studied that hard for that long like it was kind of heartbreaking um got to a point where I was like right need to need to do something about this I handed in my notice without much of a plan and as a type A personality vet who likes a list, who likes having the next five to 10 years planned. That was not comfortable at all. Um, I planned, fully planned to work my notice period and it just got worse and worse. So I ended up being on sick leave. And if any of you have been on sick pay, you'll know that even as like a fairly young person with no dependents, that sick pay was not enough. So I ended up basically using my travel fund to kind of see me through those weeks to spend a decent chunk of time in bed start eating again start sleeping properly and start just looking after myself and getting back to the things that made me feel happy and made me feel like normal and human um and a lot it basically bought me that travel fund bought me enough time to sort myself out and then go and find another job when I was in a better place to look for one and also one that I could take my time finding and that was going to be more supportive so even though I hadn't used that money for the intended purpose it was so so necessary that I had it and this is the issue I have with sort of the idea of budgeting being restrictive because in my case it so obviously bought me 
freedom. So basically the things that I want to take you from sort of me waffling on about me is that no amount of money is worth hating your job for. If you don't, if you're really that miserable, leave. It's not worth it. And money shouldn't be the thing that's making you stay. If it is, there are ways you can get yourself out of that situation. Ruth is your first port of call. Um, but yeah, if you want to then rewatch this presentation, we're going to go through the steps of how to create a budget and kind of just at least look at your bank balance without feeling completely out of your depth with it. Um, because I'm really, really glad that I kind of have that and form to those habits because I'm not really sure I'd be pleased with where I am if I hadn't or where I would be if I hadn't so yeah next slide please Katie oh, I was just going to say Cav first of all like thank you so much for sharing that so vulnerably and so openly and um I'll just quickly ask Ruth as well like you you're speaking with so many vets and so many vet nurses is this like a common theme that you're seeing come up or are there any common themes amongst the stories that you're you're hearing because I mean I resonate with a lot of what you said there Cav and I'm glad that you've got those those habits in place so you're going to share some insights here as well but actually so few of us are taught that and it's such a powerful story of showing us that actually having that in order can give us that buffer for things like this as much as I'd like to go on a holiday to xyz and it, again things like income protection too but Ruth I'd, I'd love to hear like what you've seen as a financial advisor speaking to so many people in this profession. Yeah Cav's story isn't that is, you're not alone there's so many people that go through the same but we are inevitably we we, we have this culture of just not saying and talking about it we have to put on a you know put our best foot forward we don't talk about the bad times We're like no no everything's fine everything's but then I've gone through confidential financial reviews with people and they start to talk to me and open up and it's the same it, it's very similar stories across the board and it's like you've got options and you've got help that's available to you and I do laugh when people look at me and they go, oh, you know, how much is this going to cost me? And I'm like, it's free. I'm here to help and I want to help. And they're like, oh, because we're not taught it in schools. We're not taught any of this. So how are you meant to know? So I'm so, so thankful to Cal for sharing this story because I can say it to, to people, but it takes a, you know, a real story to, to hit home to go, you're not alone. Yeah, it's been a bit of a weird few months, but yeah, definitely on the up and glad to be. And but I think the big thing is that it could have ended up obviously much worse and going on for much longer um, if things have been different. So, yeah, definitely. And like we say, there are people here that want to help. So if you resonate with what Cav's saying, that there are ways forward from that. And there's no wonder often that finances and mental health and well-being are, are so interconnected, especially at the moment. And there's actually a question that I'm going to quickly get Ruth to answer before we move forward to the next slide, Cav, just because it's it's quite well timed with what you were talking about there. We've got a question saying um, income protection, which we're going to come on to more. So if you've not heard of it, hang fire because we will explain more. Um, does it cover for mental health as well as physical health conditions or does it just depend on the product that you take out? Because obviously Cav saying taking time off in those circumstances Yep, a fantastic questions. You stopped me as I was mid, mid flow typing then. Um, but yeah, it does cover for mental health issues as well as physical health because they're stuck. Well, thank gosh, you know, that they're, they're starting to recognize that mental health is just as debilitating as a physical, you know, um, so, you know, something happening. So, yes, it does cover it. And there are different products that cover different things. But um, put a pin in it for now. We'll come back to it. Great question. And I'm going to move on to the next slide for you, Cav, now. Thank you both so much. So basically, now that you've heard, guys have heard all about me, I just want to know a little bit about you um, and just kind of work out how many of you already have a budget and are quite happy using it. You just want to kind of get some tips and tweaks and how many of you start from scratch because it'll just determine where I've sort of put the focus of the next few slides on. Okay. Amazing. So we're getting lots of answers coming through here. We've got about 75% of people saying no, 60% oh, no, 40% yes. It's all bouncing around. We've got mostly no's at the moment, but we're... we're right. If it's somewhere in the middle, that kind of suits me anyway, because then I can just go through sort of everything. But yeah, Amazing. just in terms of where to focus on. Okay, fab. Wonderful. So yeah, that's about what, 60% saying no? Yeah, so you're near enough, half and half. Um, yeah, which suits me because then it can just, I'll just go through everything evenly. 
fab. So basically now we're going to go through the way that I budget and this has been like a, as I said a refined process sort of since the beginning of uni. I've made it sound more complicated on this slide than it is. It's really sort of straightforward. The biggest bit and sort of the work intensive bit is at the beginning is starting off. Once you've got through that, you'll be absolutely grand. Um, so basically we're gonna start by looking at what you're spending. Cause as Katie said, in terms of just working out where we are now is essential to working out where we wanna go. We're then gonna sort of reflect on the spending that we're currently doing and how happy that's making us at the moment. As vet professionals, you should all be very well versed in the art of reflecting. So I'm not worried that you're gonna find that particularly tricky. And then we're kind of gonna go through what people traditionally think of as creating a budget. So sort of planning how much we're expecting to spend. And then the active bit is basically just that. It's taking action on your prospective budget, sort of thinking about what step two is gonna be for you making tweaks and making adjustments as you need to because there's no point sort of putting a couple hours into this and then never looking at it again and um, it's all about trial and error it's all about adjusting because life's constantly changing next slide please so the first bit is basically looking at your current situation and what you spend now i use a figure of three months to get sort of a basic idea of what's going on with my finances. Some people look at the last six months and I know Ruth has created a spreadsheet in the Betty resources that looks at sort of like your annual spending and you can fill that in if you'd prefer to do that. Anything more than having to look at like the last 12 weeks of bank state statements makes my brain hurt. So I go with three months, but do whatever suits you. I use Excel because as I said, I really like lists, I like tables. Um, I find Excel works for me. It's really important that whatever format you use to do this stage in that you stick with just to make everything easier. But if you prefer an app, if you prefer pen and paper, that's absolutely fine. Um, I'm gonna talk through this all based on Excel and based on the way that I do it, but the principles apply regardless of what you look at or you choose to use, just pick something that's pretty for you to look at and easy for your brain to handle. So basically for this stage, you need your last three months of bank statements, either your debit card or credit card or any account that you generally use sort of for everyday spending. I don't know if you can see at the bottom of this spreadsheet, but basically there's three tabs. So I've created a separate tab for each of the previous three months. So I created this example in February. So I've done November, December, January. And on each spreadsheet, I've created different categories of spending. So food, housing, transport, fun, whatever. And then within those categories, each one has its own table and specific expenses with an associated cost column. So if you do that on three separate spreadsheets for all th three previous months, I'd then go through my bank statement and go back to the beginning of say November or whenever, and go from the first to the last day of the month and anything that comes up as an expense on that bank statement gets added to it's an allocated to the cost box of the appropriate expense. The brilliant thing about Excel is you can use the sum function. So there's no calculators involved. It does it all for you. Um, and then you can create your totals at the bottom using the sum function as well. Once you've done that for all three months, which is gonna be, as I said, the most work intensive and boring bit, you've done the majority of the work then. You can go back and do exactly the same for your income as well. So by the end of it, you've got three months of really clear a really clear picture of exactly where your money's gone and exactly how much you had coming in for each of those three months it just makes it much easier to process than kind of the lists and lists on your bank statement next slide please so this second bit the reflective process is then looking at the spreadsheet you've created and working out how happy your spending makes you it's basically a decision making process of what we're going to keep and what we're going to plan to spend money on in the future and what we're going to try and either reduce how much we're spending on or cut it out completely and I think it's really important to like just make a note of the fact that money doesn't buy you happiness but spending it on certain things will make you happier than spending it on others so be pleased to know there's no data processing or spreadsheets really in this part it's basically doing my favorite thing of making a list so grab a pen and paper go back to that first spreadsheet and I want you to make a list of every thing you've spent money on where your spending has surprised you. So anything that you'd be a bit ashamed to tell anybody about, anything that you considered 
falsely altering the number for to make yourself feel better, add it to the list. Do that for every all of your three months and go back to the beginning and start again and add to the list anything you didn't know you were paying for. So any subscriptions you've forgotten about, any gym memberships that you keep telling yourself you'll use, but you know you won't. Um, do that for all your three months as well. And then back to the beginning again and add to the list any expenses that vary a lot each month. The reason for this is because things that are, tend to stay more fixed. So things like your rent and utility bills at the moment, as expensive as they are, you don't have a huge amount of control over. The expenses that tend to vary the most, I've found that are easier to control because they vary the most, if that makes sense. You're then going to score everything on the massive list that you made, or hopefully massive list you made, out of 10 on my system of joy points and this is basically scoring it on how happy it makes you for the money that you spend on that thing so it's not necessarily scoring you cheap things higher it's actually value for money so i've included maslow's hierarchy of needs here so because anything that is on that list that ticks any of those levels is far more likely to bring you either a sense of meaning a sense of belonging a sense of fulfillment and is therefore going to score a lot more highly the like example I've used for this that I think will hopefully make it click is that if you've got a cheap gym membership but you never go, that's going to score zero. But if you've got quite an expensive gym and spa membership that you use three times a week and the swimming does loads for your mental health and all of that kind of stuff, it's far more likely to score higher even if it is more expensive than the cheap gym membership. The point of doing this is to avoid over-restriction Similar to like food and over restricting calories, you're just going to end up binging. If you over restrict how much you're spending, thinking, right, I'm going to get control of my finances. I'm not going to spend anything for the next eight weeks. You might manage for the eight weeks and save a decent chunk in that time, but you'll fall off the wagon at the end of it. And what we really want to try and do is create something that's sustainable that you guys don't hate doing and hate having to come back to um, that can actually sort of, as we said, like, contribute to your daily habit changes that you can stick to and will hopefully be a little bit more successful everything mm -hmm. in moderation yeah we love that Kev because one of the things we talk about a lot with the financial questionnaire is as well we do it without judgment like quite often we think oh my goodness I'm not very good at budgeting because I've bought this much coffee but loving your joy point system there but Marie Kondo of finances and um, does it bring me joy if that's something that genuinely brings you joy we're not saying that you have to cut that out but maybe like you said I know when I've gone through things I'm like I've been playing for I don't know Netflix and Disney plus I don't need them both oh look I get Amazon Prime video included in my Prime membership well that could be like 300 pounds a year saved by the time that I've added this and this and this together so we love that that idea of the joy points there as well I will head you to your yeah, next slide take it away from the restrictive point of view and get it more about like keeping the stuff that makes it worth it I guess if that makes sense that makes total sense Kev Grant so at this point you should like once you've been through all these steps you should have all the information you need to create a successful budget so like going back to that joy point system my rule is if it scores seven or less I'm getting rid of it if it scores so I mean, maybe six or less, let's be a bit more, a bit nicer, six or less and getting rid of it. Seven or eight, I'll keep it and I'll plan to spend money on it, but no more than I'm already spending. Maybe try and cut down a little bit. And if it's nine or ten, it's obviously incredibly important to either my well-being, my, my relationships. It's off, obviously offering something more than just what it is I'm paying for. So it's staying. I'm absolutely going to prioritise it. So it's just kind of working out what you want and what you don't, which is obviously sort of tying into the whole goal setting thing. So this stage then, once you've done all of that, is basically sort of how we consider budgeting normally. So actually creating a budget that you plan to stick to. You may plan to stick to it and it might go totally wrong and that's completely okay. As well, the, the hardest bit is starting. Once you've started, you can come back to it and mess around with it. So 
I start with my take home income. This is because whatever else I do, I want to try and work within that. So similar as you've done on your previous spreadsheets, you're going to create a new tab or a new spreadsheet for the coming month and create a table of all of your income sources and list how much you're expecting to get paid and to take home that month. If you are a freelancer or a locum, so the advice would be to like err on the side of caution and maybe just underestimate slightly, slightly just to cover your back. You're then going to do what you've already done in terms of creating categories of spending for essential expenses. So you can just copy and paste these from your previous spreadsheets and edit them if you need to, like just edit the numbers. But essential expenses generally means your housing, your transport and food. Obviously, there'll be other things depending on if you've got dependents or other people to consider and little bits and pieces like that. But those tend to be your main categories. And then you're going to create tables for your non-essential expenses. So everything on your joy points list that you've decided to keep, um, everything that you didn't even question getting rid of because it's just that important to you, stick on there. You're then going to sort of do what you've already done to so create a column for costs. And if you just flick to the next slide, can you please, Katie? But instead of just having one column for cost, you're going to have two. So the first column is going to be what you're expecting to spend. And this is going to be how much you reckon you're going to need for that category or for that expense for the coming month. Base this on your previous three months of spending. So there's no point in me saying I've spent 50 quid on takeaway every month for the last three, but I'm not going to spend any as of next month. It's not realistic, it's setting me up for failure and I'll just be sad at the end of it when I can't have takeaway. So be realistic, use the numbers that you've already got to kind of guide your decision making. You're then gonna set up an extra column that's actual cost. And this is gonna be what we come back to week on week, fortnightly, whatever you can set time aside to do to keep it up to date with your bank statements as you go, just like you've done in that first step. Keep a running total. Keeping on top of it does two things. It stops you getting overwhelmed. And it also means if you need to make adjustments halfway through the month, you can do without going completely over budget. If I spend too much on grocery shopping one week, I can take that out of my takeaway budget and just mess around with the numbers till I'm happy without sort of completely falling off the wagon. If you just go back for me a second, Katie, please. So once you've kind of worked out what you reckon your essential expenses are going to be, what you reckon your non-essential expenses are going to be. Hopefully both of them combined are going to be less than your take home income. If it's not, you need to consider either looking for a better paying job or cutting back on your expenses a little. The gap then, so the money in between is what we're going to allocate to savings. It's really handy to think of this as an actual number rather than like a percentage. Or if you think of it as a percentage, that's fine, but write it down as an actual number somewhere on your spreadsheet. For some reason, we they've done studies that prove that we have, like we don't associate percentages with sort of actual money, which is why, top tip, if you are asking for a pay rise, you should always do it in percentages because apparently it's harder for your boss to actually think of that in monetary terms as, instead of like asking for an actual number. Didn't know that until this week. Um, so yeah. That's what we're going to try and set aside for savings and that's going to be the saving target for whatever that month is. The good thing about doing a budget month on month as well is it allows for if you've got to pay your house insurance or you've got to pay your car tax one month, that's fine. You can adjust as you need to for that month. Next slide, please. So yeah, hopefully you've got something that kind of looks a little bit like this now for the month going forward. You'd obviously do this for all of your expenses, you'd have an income table and you would also have how much you're planning to save for that month. Next slide please. And then this is the sort of easy bit because you've done all the work now, this is the active budgeting phase. So basically once your budget's created for that month, as I've said, you want to try and come back to it as often as you possibly can. I try and do it weekly, but I probably don't really stick to that. It's probably more like fortnightly. Um, I have quite an obsessive personality, so I have to be very careful because I swing through either like not doing it for weeks and then I'll do it daily when it's not helpful. So yeah, try and aim for every week if you can. Um, it just allows you to, as I said, make adjustments as necessary. Because we're kind of allocating expected spending and money that we're planning, as soon as your income comes into your bank account, it can be really helpful just to move what you've allocated to savings or what you plan to allocate to savings to another account outside, out of mind, and then just work within your budget with whatever's left. 
don't beat yourself up you nobody like I don't think gets this right first time just like anything and I know as vets we expect ourselves to be perfect at everything first time um I'm still dealing with the fact that we're not I'm still struggling with that so yeah when I sort of started budgeting or trying to work out how to budget I got it wrong so many times um it's fine like just go again maybe it's that you don't like excel maybe it's that you just were a little bit over optimistic or you had an emergency expense come up when you were trying to save an emergency fund it's absolutely grand just go again don't give up on it is what I'm trying to say next slide please uh, I love that insight as well, just jumping in quickly to say when, when we're talking a lot about habits as well, we're talking about like a 1% improvement every day and you're so right and we speak to so many people in the profession that we so often ask ourselves to like be 100% better at something in like a week or two weeks or three months and actually underestimate that power of those tiny gains and just making those improvements month on month so really amazing insights there and I'm loving the percentage on the negotiation tip as well oh, really cool. I found yeah. that really strange that it made such a difference but yeah I thought it was interesting it's a good one. I've just dropped in the chat. We did a negotiation event if anyone wants to jump in there, but I will be passing that that one on to our negotiation um, expert, Paul, as well, because I feel like that's a really interesting insight. So there you are. Next slide. Thank you. Um, yeah, just if you don't like Excel, don't, don't give up. It's all right. Uh, there are other ways you can budget that might work better with how your brain processes information. Um, and having it on your phone, if you do want to use an app, can be super helpful when you're out and you're like, oh, can I actually afford to buy that? Then you can check. Um, so Money Dashboard is brilliant. There's Snoop as well. I don't know much about Snoop, but I know a few people that use it and do like it. Plum's quite cool. It's got an investment function as well, if that's something that you're interested in. But obviously, like, get advice from the people that know before doing anything with that. Um, spending pots are great if you don't conceptualise money on a spreadsheet well, if you deal better with either physical cash or sort of yeah and you need it to have it and hold it to sort of believe it and see it kind of thing and feel it you can withdraw the cash in the way that you budgeted and just put it into different envelopes for categories of spending and once it's gone for that month it's gone there are obviously because we're living in a massively sort of cashless society at the moment and probably going forwards as well there are virtual ways of doing that so like monzo and virgin offer virtual spending pots which can be quite helpful um the bottom two points are just different ways of budgeting, really. So the 50, 30, 20 rule, Katie's done a post on quite recently that um, you might want to have a look at if you're interested in that because it's super helpful. But basically, it's just if you don't know how much to allocate to an expected ex expense, it's quite a helpful starting point to say that you're going to allocate 50% of your take home income to your essential expenses. So your food, your housing and transport, like we talked about. 30% to sort of non-essential and fun money and 20% for savings and then you can play around with that as you need to. There's also the zero based budget which is pretty much what we've kind of gone through and what I do which is basically saying right when my money comes in this is where it's going to go and at the end it's totaling zero in the in the sense that it's been allocated to a category. Um, you can use any of these in conjunction with each other. You can use an app in conjunction with Excel or whatever, or the 50, 30, 20 in conjunction with the zero based budget, whatever works for you. I just wanted to sort of make you guys aware that if you don't like anything I've said, that's fine. Um, there's other options and just to have a play and see what you like. Next slide, please. I know now you've got some tips for new grads, which I realise are applicable to probably all of us at any point as well. But um, I know these were ones specifically that you'd um, wanted to share here as well, weren't you, Kath? Yeah, so I wanted to keep these in. Um, I wasn't sure about it, but I realised that obviously they're most applicable to new grads, but it's still kind of handy if you are either changing, sort of if you've got, you're getting a pay rise or you're changing jobs or anything like that. Basically, if your situation's changing, it can really help if you understand your payslip. Usually the explanation of your payslip will be like in your employee handbook or it'll come with the payslip itself. Um, but just to make sure that if there are any deductions or anything you don't understand that you know why, uh, just to make sure you're not missing out basically. There aren't many good reasons to opt out of your pension. If it's something you're planning on doing, I would speak to somebody like Ruth or Ruth first. Because effectively, especially if you've got an employer match, 
and your employer is contributing to your pension, if you opt out, you're turning away free money, even though it's free money that you can't access right now, it's free money for future you. Um, it's worth doing, especially if you are going into a new job, a higher paying job, or you're straight out of uni, you're not going to notice the difference. So you might as well just get used to it when you're not really going to be able to tell. Um, and then the couple other things that are more specific to new grads, it's absolutely fine if you need to use your first couple pay packets to stabilise yourself, if you need to sort your car repairs so you can actually get to your job, or if you need to get yourself out of your student overdraft or anything like that that's fine if there's not savings to be made immediately that's not to say don't budget it'll still help but it's okay if there's the gap in between your expenses and your income is small to begin with and you just want to sort of sort yourself out and then this is something that I wish I'd been told and didn't realize was going to happen but basically when you graduate because you don't graduate till the July from the April your tax allowance is building up but you don't actually start using it until the July so you've got tax allowance sort of like left over so your first couple paychecks are going to be higher than the future ones which I didn't know so I started budgeting according to my first paycheck and then sort of because I started working the August come the October the or November my pay had dropped and I wasn't expecting it but it's basically just to say expect a pay drop of I think mine was like a couple hundred pounds um after that first sort of three or four months just based on tax allowance and then last one is just for everyone to just be aware of lifestyle inflation I think most people are familiar with the concept of inflation at, in, at the moment um but just because you're going into more money doesn't mean that you need to spend more money one of the best pieces of advice I got was to sort of continue living like a student as much as I could even though I'm on a vet salary and um, that's helped me massively sort of manage to save a little bit more than I probably would have done otherwise but I don't need to spend like yeah like I've got a pay rise basically or like I've got a new paycheck because I was managing just fine before um, so yeah, just bits and pieces that I sort of wish I'd been told about. I'll unmute myself because I was just speaking without. Um, thank you so much, Kev. That's so useful, so insightful. And I think so many of those points are applicable to us, especially lifestyle inflation. I don't know if anyone else resonates with this, but quite often in society, as we get a pay rise, we get a more expensive car, we get a bigger house. And actually we end up with just a small amount of money as we did like previously, even though we'd theoretically been paid more as well. So that was really, really helpful. I loved like the, the idea of going through that process, which I know is something that we try and encourage a lot of people to do at Vet U, like, where are you now? And just going on that segue back to the beginning again, like, where are you now? What's going on? Where do you want to be? And how much more cash do we need for that? Is it that you want to drop a day a week and you want to see if you can live on the budget of how much that would be? Is it that you want to start investing some money and you want to build up a savings pot? How much do you want to try and save per month? And then, like I've said, fit that into the budget and then go back and reflect on it as well. Because us actively doing this is us giving ourselves the freedom rather than, and I know I say this from having been there, I put my head in the sand for a long time and was like, as long as I'm just like, I'm coasting through the overdraft and it will be okay. And actually, if I'd sat back when I first graduated and did just what you've done there, I'm sure that there'd probably be a lot more in my pension pot as well. But importantly, what we were just gonna to touch on next is bearing in mind that when we've got our roles, we've got our salaries, maybe we've got businesses, perhaps we've got side hustles and we've got that amount of cash that's coming in every month. And just like I've said, sometimes our circumstances change. I know on a personal level for me, last month I hurt my back and ended up with three weeks out of work. Really unexpectedly, one Sunday morning, I bent down to pick something up. I stood up and I was out of action for weeks. We never know when that's going to happen. So actually, what protections have we got in place? And that's what we wanted Ruth to touch on as well, because this is part of our freedom and us being independent is thinking about what can we protect so that if something does happen, what backup have we got? So Ruth, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much. I just wanted to say what Cab put on the previous slides was just, there's some really good tips there. Um, I just wanted to add on to that as well is I get a lot of um, calls asking for what percentage do I put in for this and for that. I think it's a great it's not one rule for all so it's kind of a bit of a guide but cut you cut your coat to your cloth type of thing so it's 
if if you need to spend more money on certain areas then then you'll need to do that so don't kind of break yourself to stick to certain percentages because every single um person is different and uh, an individual and will have different needs as well um i don't so yeah i just wanted to say with that so protection this is the main one that I get asked a lot. Um, it's always comes part of anything that I get. I think out of the 200 people that I've spoken to uh, within the veterinary community, I think only about two haven't asked for protection because they've already had it. Um, it is so, so important. Um, there's loads of different forms of protection that you can have. We've got income protection on the screen currently. Um, so income protection can help provide an income in case you are sick and unable to work and bring kind of your, your income back. So the reason why, before anyone does anything with me, and this is how important I, I think of it, I always say, what protection do you have in place? What do you have with your current employer? Or do you have something privately? Because I could set an investment up for you if you are lucky enough to have some spare um, set aside. But say you do fall ill, like unfortunately Cav did, it's one of those where, um, you know, your sick pay might not cover all of your bills so you have to start eating into those savings and then any savings plan you've got will stop because your priority is paying your bills if you're off so an income protection can pay up to 60 percent of your salary um, should you be off like i've said um, sick or unable to work um, there's also life insurance um, in case you're no longer here and you might want to leave something behind to look after your family um, in case of this. And then critical illness. Um, critical illness is something that would pay out a lump sum in case of a diagnosis of, say, a life threatening illness like um, coronary heart disease, a heart attack, um, uh, something serious like cancer. So it would. It's designed to help make a stressful and light, 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 a life-changing situation a bit more easier to cope with. But yeah, income protection is definitely number one. And you're really fortunate that, you know, thanks to Katie, you guys, everyone on this call has the opportunity for, you know, a free to get free quotes to find out how what affordability is like for you and we do all the legwork for you it might take a little bit of like you just need to give your time initially to talk us through your circumstances if you've had um any prior conditions or anything because don't think if you've been injured or you've been off sick previously that you're not going to be able to get covered because that's a myth you can still get covered and there are so many options still available and one of my favorite sayings is if plan A doesn't work, there's what, 25 different letters in the alphabet to go at. So we've lo lots and lots of different options, but yes, please, income protection is really important. And like Katie said, it's, God, I hear all kinds of stories. I try to like, and I'll say this one again, because it still sticks with me. I tried to, um, someone said they wanted income protection. They were a very high earner and, um, they, I put them in touch, but they didn't follow through with the call. Um, I followed up about a couple of weeks later, just checked in, said, hey, how are you doing? Um, they had a massive car accident on the way to, to work with a hit and run with a lorry. Um, and now we can't get protection for them because they've got something. You, you can't do anything after the horse has bolted. You know, you've got to have it there. And it is um, better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. So please just have a look at that if, if, if you're able to. Um, but yeah, that's why I think income protection is important. Is there anything I've missed there, Katie? I was just gonna say like, we are so grateful for Ruth because don't underestimate how much her and her team are fighting your corner. If any of you have got pre-existing conditions, chronic illnesses, you're worried, oh my goodness, am I gonna get covered? I've dropped in the chat box, there's a link to some sessions that we did with the British Veterinary Chronic Illness um, Charity, just talking through the fact that Ruth is the one there, just like, you know, when we're writing letters to insurance companies saying, oh, I don't think this limp in the front left leg is um, a reason to not ever insure this dog ever again. They're there doing that for us and speaking to the underwriters in the way that we can. And I cannot tell you, I've come across very few financial advisors that care as much as Ruth does. Like we get endless, fantastic, lovely testimonials because 
you know she's got a heart of gold and she just wants to wants to help us because it's heartbreaking to hear those stories and they're just a handful like we all know someone that's been hit when they've been in the crush that's fallen over the pavement that's bent down and picked something up off the sofa and ended up in the hospital for 10 days with their back I mean like you can't make it up so just and it's cheaper to do it as well while you're younger than it is then to leave it and do it when you're older because obviously you're less likely to be um to be off sick or injured when you're younger so um it it can work in your benefit to 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 sort it out now yeah and it's one of those things that oh, sorry. Oh, go for it go on Kev sorry the conversation we have with pet owners all the time isn't it it's they like you don't think you need it until you need it and until you need it it feels like a waste of money and it's it just isn't yeah oh hopefully it is hopefully it gets to be and you never have to use it and you never have to touch it and it's brilliant but yeah I think we harp on that much about the importance of insurance to pet owners but then we don't really consider it so and I'm, I'm not Katie will say this it's not to toot my our own home with this but you could there are other options available you could just go online and get something but is that provider gonna pay out should anything happen because they might go oh well you know when you were 10 years ago you had a prior condition of a broken toe that you didn't tell us about the the main thing is is that you have the backup of us as well to say well we've done all of this and we fight your corner for you and help you should you need to claim as well I was going to ask that that very thing because we see that with pet owners don't we they're like yes I'm fully insured and then we read the policy and we realize that they've not actually got a huge pot there or that maybe they've only taken it out a few days before or maybe it doesn't cover for certain conditions. And one of the things, and maybe you can briefly touch on this before we move on as well, is that there are policies that will cover for you not being able to do your current job and there are ones that will cover you for not being able to work at all. Because you kind of explain a bit around that for us, finding policies that are fit for purpose, I guess, too, because that's something that really surprised me because... I think for a long time with one of the protection policies I had, I was like, oh, I'm covered. And then I realized that it wasn't just for me being a vet. It was saying, well, you're only covered if you can't work at all. Yeah, um, good. It's great, great point as well. So affordability um, is it could be an issue. Then what you can do are there are different versions of kind of income protection you can have. So you've got ones that are like own occupation. So think of that as like the Royals Royce of income protection. And it is the it's the most preferred because should you not be able to perform your own job, then it will pay out. There's something that's on the lower level, which is called suited occupation. So, for instance, if you're a veterinary surgeon and then you're able to go and um, uh, do a lecture, you know, you might not be able to do your job, but you could go and talk about it. Then they will put you in a suited occupation instead of paying out. So obviously there's that. Um, And then there's... um, So own an any occupation. Um, So that's kind of the cheapest one, um, which will also mean that if you could make the brews, the tea or the coffee coffee in your in your practice, then that's what they will have you do rather than pay out. So obviously there's it goes down. um, The cheaper ones is obviously any occupation, own occupation of not being able to do your own job is the one that is um, the most preferred. But it's tiered so it all comes down to affordability but yeah thanks Kate it's great great question Uh, so I'll explain Ruth and we've had a comment in the chat as well just saying I can second to anyone thinking about having just set up income protection and critical illness cover through one of Ruth's contacts it was very easy and I wish I'd done it sooner so you've heard it from someone that is not us so if you would like to book in with Ruth and chat through income protection with having an expert behind you as well that is there um, and we've got someone else, same here, Aoife, thank you very much, um, that actually has your best interests at heart as well, um, and making sure that that policy is fit for purpose and we don't end up with a surprise further down the road, then I've popped the link in the chat box for Ruth's Calendly, I'll pop that back in again as well. I realise we're coming to time, um, I was quickly just going to show you the next slide, because I always love this one, this is one of Ruth's just showing the different areas of us thinking about a financial plan as we move forward essentially and how Ruth can help you with any of these six parts it's not just that Ruth is just for income protection and I think without getting you to dive into this because I think we know what a lot of these are as well Ruth but a lot of people think financial advice is just for people with 
massive property portfolios, maybe some inheritance come in, perhaps a lot of cash. And one of the things I know you're really keen at breaking down the barriers to from your own story is making it accessible to everyone. And that's why you're part of what we're doing at Bet You, isn't it? Yeah, a hundred percent. You do get the, the stereotypical financial advisors that come out there and go, right, I'll only deal with if you earn this much. Um, I want to reshape the way that financial services is 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 seen and i'm on a mission to do that um and financial advice is accessible to everybody because we're not taught it in schools i go into schools and into workplaces to try and um start the coaching with this and i do it free of charge i just want to help educate and there are so many different areas of it um and I've been there. I've had such a kind of a career of doing different things. You know, I was told to opt out of a pension when I first started work and I did. And it is. And, and so I've, I've made that mistake and I came. That's obviously before I did this job and I've suffered for it now because I'm a lot older and I look at what that pension could be worth now if I'd have just stuck with those small payments. So when Cav says stick with the fine, you know, with opting your pension, it is so powerful. You might not think it is, but it really is. So I um, I mean, I, I don't get me started on pensions because, yeah, we will be here all night because I love them, but it's one of those where if you're confused about workplace pension, personal pension, I've got lots everywhere, we can talk through it. Savings, if you're fortunate enough to have a little bit spare and you want to know what to do with it, I can advise you um, of protect where to go. Uh, debts, it's not just all hunky-dory. If you do have debts, don't panic. There are options available to you. Um, and I can have a look and say, right, actually, these guys are taking the you know and then I'll get on the you get on a call and have a word um so it's just about having someone that has you back and genuinely cares and I honestly do a little bit too much but yeah I, I really do and we can definitely back that up Ruth cares a lot so if you are just feeling like okay I'm starting to figure out where I am now I've got a bit of an idea of where I want to be, but it feels like I'm at the foothill of this mountain and I've got some bits of action to take but I really need someone there to help me make sure I'm protected. Maybe you do have that spare cash and you want it to keep up with inflation because um, inflation is going up so much that quite often our cash sat in the bank isn't always doing anything, which I know Ruth has talked about. There's a recordings of the savings and investment session that she did. Like any of these areas that we need help with, just reach out. I know Ruth's sessions are free of charge. She gifts her time there. And um, she's going to be very clear if there is a charge for something at some yeah. point, like a product and things like that. So we're really grateful to have Ruth on board there as well. It's a fun um, experience. Yeah. It is. Honestly, don't be don't be scared of it. We have a laugh. We talk about things, you know, uh, all kinds of different things. And, it, you know, it is it does is enjoyable. So I pop the link anyway, if you want to have a chat, because you know, we're not taught this stuff. So we don't know what we don't know, do we? And we keep saying this again and again, but let's just be empowered to realize that by taking these little daily actions, accepting the help that's here and is really willing to help you, we can get ourselves in a position that's more empowering and work towards that independent us. So there's huge amounts of tools on that YouTube link from Vet You. We've got so many recordings. We've done like 15 events so far this year. We're here just at the other end of the email. If you think, oh my goodness, I need an accountant. Um, I'm not sure where to start. Just drop into hello at vetu.co.uk because we're here. This is why we put so many hours per week into running these sessions because this is powerful stuff and we don't want anyone out there struggling with this and feeling like there's not a way to go. So if anyone does have questions, please do pop them in the chat or come back to them in a second. I realise we are pushing for time. So we are very, very um, aware of your valuable time, which is the most valuable thing that we've got actually as well, because we can't get it back once it's gone. If you do have anything you want to ask, please do. I know we had one question that was pre-submitted about like percentages of how much should I put into the pension? I think Ruth covered that really well already of saying, it depends on you and your affordability and have a chat with Ruth, like go through, do just what Cav said of going through, like, what am I spending right now? What's available? Like what's realistic for me to put in there and then chat to Ruth around that as well, because she's here and she's willing to help. And just what I wanted to say as we're coming to the end is that we are going to be creating some spaces where you can jump in and you can get your budgets done because at the end of the day how often do we make this like a, a next week thing um we'll do it next month when we were talking about us versus future us 
it's easy for us to pass it off to future us because it feels like we're giving it to someone else, doesn't it? You know, we'll give it to them. They'll be able to do it. They'll have more free time than me. So what we're aiming to do is just book out some like one hour sessions. We've given you a choice if you want to register your interest, whether you prefer like a weekend morning or a weekday evening. We're just going to do them like every two or three months. You jump in. You've got Ruth or one of our like accountants or experts there. You can ask a couple of questions. We'll pop some music on and you can actually just do your budget, whether you have a small business, whether you're employed, whether you're a locum, side hustler, whether you've got multiple streams of income, whatever that success piece looks like for you. Let's come and all be in a space together and actually do that at the same time, because it's a bit of accountability, it's community, and it means that actually we've got a space where we can get it done. And I know we're really excited about this, so I'll make sure that link goes into the chat box as well. And... We would love for you to think about what action you're going to take off the back of today. So get it in the chat box for us. Um, and then we can know what your step two will be, essentially, because that's going to look different for all of us. What have been your light bulb moments? What have been your, your take homes? What have been your real insights? Because we would love to know them. And um, I was going to just jump back to Ruth and say, would there be anything that you'd add to what we've talked about this evening, knowing that this is step one is our clarity, really, and are starting to put those little habits and steps in place to to make this happen? Yeah, there's there's no right or wrong way to start budgeting. It's step number one, um, just whether it's on a piece of paper, whether it's however on your phone, through an app or on an Excel spreadsheet, just just make a start and maybe just go through it you know give yourself five minutes a day just to start familiarizing yourself um you don't have to set aside three hours but slowly slowly and if you have a question just send me an email even if you don't want to jump on a call i'll email you back um whatever's easiest for you um but i was going to say my biggest take home i think from what we said today was actually um cab saying about how much joy something is that you spend on because we spend so much but realistically does it spark joy um, and it got me thinking. So, yeah, I'm going to take that away and now be more conscious of when I am spending something. What What is it on and do I really need it? And is it sparking joy? So, yeah. Such That's a good point. That makes yeah. me really happy. Yeah. I love that because it just addresses one of those points that comes up so frequently of, budgeting feeling like a restriction of well I must cut out anything that's not a necessity and like you say what is this bringing me what is my joy return on investment for this and that's that's huge and um I was telling Cav actually before Ruth jumped on the call and this is um it made me laugh at the time because Ruth and I went out for coffee over the weekend didn't we Ruth yeah and the barista knew my order and went I'm assuming this one's yours Katie and I thought well I'm sure Ruth will know where my coffee budget goes then. She's just blown my cover, hasn't she? <laughs> no judgment. No judgment. Yeah, honestly, it's, uh, it's, it's about what makes you happy. There's please don't ever chastise yourself or tell yourself off for buying something. Um, if it sparks joy, then we'll, we'll budget it in and do it, you know, and we'll make a plan for it, whatever that may be, whether it's a hobby, whether it's a thing. Um, yeah, there's I've, I've heard it all um, to the latest one. Someone bought a dinghy and was like, I have no need for this dinghy, but I seem to now have it. And I was like, yeah, we need to chat. <laughs> Uh, sure my brother did something similar like bought an inflatable thingy and then like because like I think he bought it drunk but because he bought it he's like right I'm gonna make this worth it and I'm gonna go out and use it and actually absolutely loves it has a wild time with it so yeah completely worth it makes him really happy I love that and it comes back to one of the tips we've shared a few times actually on Bet You as well is if we're like internet shopping leaving something in the basket for 24 hours and seeing like going back like is it still sparking that same amount of joy as it did when I went to go and buy it on impulse like 24 hours previously and I do that all the time and I'll tell you a lot of the time I go back and I'm like oh, I probably don't really need it now and that saves me a heck of a lot of money so it's just these little tweaks of what we do on a daily basis isn't it and very true um I can see Ruth just answered this in the chat because we're just coming to the end now but what would you say is the most important budgeting priority for new grads pensions income protections it all seems so far away um and Ruth I know you've just popped income protection there as well yeah, I just thought, um, but check if your company has it, um, because they might actually offer it as a, you know, as a benefit of you joining. Um, 
I think um, they talk about this, don't you, in one of your chats saying that when you do have these conversations with new companies, ask what they provide. Do they give you a pension? Do they offer you, there's something called death in service as well, which pays out a lump sum to help cover any debts should anything happen to you. But income protection, because if you lose that income because something happens, how are you going to pay your bills? Um so, yeah, I think that's the most important. There's so much, but we'll come to what is the most important to you. Just um, have a think about it. And maybe this conversation and webinar has sparked that, that thought for you. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Ruth. And I realise we have gone over time now, so I'm going to come to an end. You can see on our screen here, we've got loads of events coming up. We've got um, another session for our locums around taxes and IR35 with Reese, who is a fantastic expert in this area. Then the next month, we've got mortgages. In between that, we will be running another savings and investments event with Ruth at some point as well. So keep your eye out. And it's just been fantastic to have you all here as well. Hopefully, you've had some insights to get you started. And like we say right at the beginning, a journey of a thousand miles starts with one step. So sometimes it's just as getting a little bit of help. It's getting that bit of clarity, like Ruth said, giving yourself five minutes and doing something that that future financial self is going to thank you for. And you'll look back and say, I'm so glad I did that rather than those stories that we're sharing of saying, oh, I wish I hadn't opted out of that. Or I wish I prioritized all this stuff 10 years ago, rather than me being here, helping facilitate people learning about it now, 10 years down the line. So honestly, thank you all so much. It's been fantastic. Thank you, Cav. You have been amazing. That's been such fantastic insights. You were brilliant. And Ruth, as ever, for your fantastic support and expertise and being so kind to our community and really helping so many people because I know we get so many fantastic kind messages saying Ruth has been brilliant and um, we know many more of you all from that too so if you do want to book in with Ruth again I've popped that link in the chat box you can pick a time that suits you you can give as much or as little information as you want about you while you're in there and she'll have a good chat through just your individual circumstances like we would do if a pet was coming to the vets like we can learn as much as we can but knowing the individualities we're better going to someone that spent the time learning that stuff so and thank, thank you, you Katie for hosting today yeah. thank you yeah you hear it thank you both of you it's much appreciated Pleasure. Oh, thank Pleasure. you I will